Hello again, everybody, and welcome to another record-setting edition of the Jim Cornette Experience. I am Jim Cornette, broadcasting from high atop a so cool, I feel a chilly Castle Cornette here today for the big program where we're going to talk about new additions at Castle Cornette. Also, my trip to Florence, not Italy, folks. And we're going to have a partial review of NXT, at least the stuff that I saw. And I'm sure that we'll piss somebody off with these comments, ladies and gentlemen, to join me in this. Hawaiian Brian, the podcasting lion, the king of the Arcadian Vanguard Podcast Network, Mr. Co-host to you, the post office playboy, even though he's not paying the rent with Susie, the proprietor of the French Toast Chateau, your friend and mine, the big kahuna, the great Brian Last, everybody. Aloha, Jim. I'd like to say it's a pleasure to be here, but now I question if that it really is a pleasure. The big kahuna. <laughs> The big King Kamehameha, the big kahuna. I'll take that. The big kahuna, I think of Gino Moore, and that's not a winning proposition for anyone. Well, I was I was actually even thinking more of of like uh, Sir Oliver Humperdinck, but that depending on which which way you go with that may not have been a compliment. I loved Hump to death. He wasn't an attractive man. Did you ever see that really awful movie from the eighties, Back to the Beach? Where Frankie and Annette go back to the beach with their kids. and Oh, yes, yes, yes. And he's it was almost as bad as the Back to the Beaver. <laughs> or where was where, one, where yeah. Tony Dow and Jerry Mathers went back to June Cleaver's Beaver. I don't fucking know. Well, they're in the movie, too, by the way. Tony Dow and Jerry Mathers and Barbara Billingsley are in the movie as judges <laughs> for the surfing contest at the Big Kahuna, Frankie Avalon. Uh, I forget if he wins or he wipes out. But either way, one of the worst movies ever. And it was on all the time for a few years there. All the time. All the time. Well, we're on all the time. You know, you were just <laughs> telling me before we went on the air here to do this, this fucking program. But now I'm, fuck, I'm so verklempt. I'm, I'm having to start thinking about taking this thing seriously. You were starting to tell me before we went on the air of the giant numbers, the ridiculous increase in downloads the massive increases in the YouTube views and just the ways that people consume. And, and you know what happens when you consume, you make a con out of Sue and me. I don't know. <laughs> you know what? <laughs> <laughs> the different ways that people consume the program. And I'm like, fuck now you, you're, it's almost going to kill the gimmick here. If I start taking this thing seriously, because whereas other people, that that put these fine podcasting programs together. They have, well, yeah, I mean, just in, in in any genre of podcasting doesn't have to be uh, us wrestling folk, but it all they have the 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 big sound effects and the budgets and the the professional announcers and the theme music and the stingers in and out of the brain. And they just go about things in a professional way, like you would imagine that somebody would do if they were doing a radio broadcast. Whereas you and I, my friend. The whole appeal, the whole draw, the whole uh, 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 attraction of our program, and and the reason why we have the the closeness that we do with our listeners, uh, fondly referred to as the cult of Cornette. The reason we're for all this is because we just have a conversation. We just talk to each other like two nitwits on the fucking phone, saying basically when obviously from the cataclysmic fucking controversies that we stir up on a regular basis. We have no filter, either one of us, but we just do this. We just talk. And if I'm starting to think, if I take this seriously and try to do a program that possibly all this success will, will go away because it will, it will, it'll take the heart out of things. So I'm thinking about just not just continuing to do what I've been doing. And that's not to take this seriously in any way or to do any work on this fucking fiasco. And, and it'll continue to get more popular. Well, let me just make one correction. We do indeed have sound effects here on this show. You see? Yes, Sting, I am your father. How about this? Sting. <laughs> you had it right through your button on it. Wait just, a me, just me, Sting. Just me, Sting. Oh, wait a minute. Here's one. I like, it. yeah, that this should be every time I talk about the outlaw mud show wrestlers from now on. <laughs> uh, but anyway, so you were telling, you were telling me about that. So we got a lot of new listeners, folks. So pardon us sometimes to the old crowd. If we chew our food twice and repeat some things 
that you may already know, but since we've got all these people, we're trying to service the new customer as well as the old customer. The old customer is jaded. It's been serviced so much. It needs a little extra every once in a while to get the old motor started. But the new customers, we're in virgin territory there. Just a little tickle of the taint, and they're ready to go. Um, we, we've got new additions here at the castle. And first of all, this is... Uh, on on the drive through this past Monday, which is setting records also, and everybody should listen to the drive through because that's where we disseminate and inseminate the information and the education to the people by answering their questions. And it comes out every Monday. When we record it is another story entirely. But I said I was surly that morning because I was hot. The air conditioning was out. People owed me money. They, they still owe me money. Uh, I'll, I'll give you an update on that if, if I get one. Uh, but I was in a real surly mood. But now it, it's changed to the point where I don't even know if I can do a, a proper criticism today because I'm in a good mood. We have a new addition here at the castle, a new baby deer. Just oh. been seeing the little new baby. I don't know if it's the son or daughter, I haven't got that close yet, of, of Snickers, the baby deer that you will recall from a couple of years ago that we had here at the castle. Uh, but the family of deer that lives over in the, the the guy two properties over hasn't touched his back two acres in 40 years. So it's a jungle. And I like it that way because they live over there. But then they come over to my place to sun and drink in the creek. And so we got the new baby, probably about a foot tall, it looks like, with the binoculars and, and you know, maybe a eight, 10 pound little baby deer there. So that's that's going good. We should have a contest here on a show, a contest to name the new baby deer. Cause now the, there's apparently six in the family now. Cause we had five, we've saw five all together just a few weeks ago. So we had, we had taken the census at five, but the, this new baby is, is brand new. So I think we're up to six for the neighborhood deer family. We have so many deer here. It has to be multiple families. Okay. Ed McMahon. So you just got, I have a little population of deer in my backyard that I like to speak about. And you go, oh, well, we got a million of them. It ain't nothing for us to have multiple families. These, these things are fucking like fucking rabbits. Did Ed McMahon have deer? No, Ed McMahon would always, <laughs> you don't know this, do you? Because you're, you're a younger generation. I watched the reruns of Carson. Okay, but mean? whenever Carson would expect that he would get some low figure or whatever on an estimate or so, he would expect to get something so then he could just blow it out of the water. McMahon would, would just, just top him before he got there. And, 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 and then he would sit there and go, ah. but anyway, nevertheless, do the bears where you live at all? No, we don't have bears. Where do you think we live in a goddamn in the great smoky mountains? I have bears. You have bears in New Jersey. We have a lot of bears in New Jersey. Fortunately, we've only seen a few here. Uh, actually last year, I don't know if I said it on the air or not, but at one point, Suzanne's grandmother and her aunt were here and they look outside and they see the bear and they flip out and they had to be taken back to Queens right away. And as Suzanne's taking them down the street to Queens, another bear ran out right <laughs> from the car. So they, they, it took them a long time to convince them. To come so how here. much, how much did it cost you to get those friends of yours dressed up in them bear suits to run <laughs> them back to, back to Queens? Yeah. Anyway. Well, all right. Now that you've blown the goddamn, how about my air conditioning story? Since you've blown my deer story up with your lions and tigers and bears, oh my. Um, it, 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 here's an update. The air conditioning, as we mentioned, went out about a week ago here in, in, the, uh, in the, the office at the castle. I have my own dedicated air conditioning unit for the office, and it went kerflooey. And it's never been right anyway. I mentioned on the drive-thru, I was underserved when it was installed. It wasn't powerful enough. It didn't have the jackhammer-like refrigeration tendency enough. But also, uh, once again, the, apparently the original installers were Republicans. Because when they came in to put this thing in, they said, well, we're going to enlarge that air intake because you need these two big ones. I got one big one over here. I got the other one down here. It's so small. We're going to enlarge that. You need to be taking in more air with this giant unit that you've purchased to make sure that things will circumallate properly. And then when they got into that air intake, they found out, well, you know, this ain't connected to anything. It's just, it was just a fucking vent in the wall, and the, the duct went nowhere to anything. So they say, that could have been part of your problem also. <laughs> so 
So by the time that they finished, <clears throat> and they saw it, and they put a big hole in the wall and put me another intake in, and they fixed it all up and everything, but they put this Mac Daddy of a three-ton, 80,000 BTU unit. This thing, oh, my, the thermostat is purdy. And it automatically tells you what the humidity is, and 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 it it automatically dehumidifies this sticky air we got around here in Louisville, Kentucky, this time of year. And they got that thing in, and I turned it on, and and now of course, last week every day was ninety degrees. As soon as they put this in, it's a freak cold spell in June here in Louisville. But the force of the air, it will knock you down coming out of these vents. It look it turns the air blue like the Mister Freeze uh, areas whenever he walks across the screen in the fucking Batman television program. You have icicles hanging off your nose. I'm shivering, shaking like a dog shitting peach seeds, as we found out was highly popular over the weekend. Uh, it's it's uh, this is the first time. <laughs> Well, we did. There was a lot of commentary it on. Did get a reaction? I have to. Admit. A, a lot of commentary on Ernie Ladd calling a dog shitting peach seeds. <laughs> <clears throat> you, if you didn't listen to the drive-through, see these are the things you miss <laughs> out on, folks. But anyway, um, so you can freeze up here. The first time that I've had proper air in my in my fortress of solitude here. So I'm jacked off. I'm jacked up. I'm jacked. You're jacked I'm, off. I'm jacked about this. <laughs> This has been a banner show so far, I have to say. <laughs> well, it's going to get worse. Let me just say this. Uh, let's go to charity. I said last week, <laughs> when all else fails, and, and then go to charity. They can't shit on you for talking about giving money to charity. Um, I said last week we'd have totals here on the program, and we do. Folks, as you know, at jimcornett.com, as part of Cornette's Collectibles, uh, we've been raising money for the American Cancer Society uh, on the Midnight Express uh, autograph photos and the packages where the, the lost books were found uh, and, and raising money with that over the last, what's it been, six months or so. Uh, so anyway, for the month of May, from the Midnight Express packages and pictures, we raised $2,190 for the American Cancer Society, and that's plus now, but that's not counting. Uh, Lee Petrie gave a $100 check. Several other people, I wish I'd have started writing this down when it started happening. I didn't know it was going to turn into such a thing, but uh, other members of the cult have contributed and, and either tweeted about it or written about it. Jeremy Bagley has been a beast with this whole thing, jacked up Jeremy with yeah. matching contributions when the uh, uh, other pictures sold out and now he's got a fundraiser going on Facebook uh, in honor of Dennis Condry. So <clears throat> that's that. And then uh, Cornette's collectibles all time, all time being the past six months uh, contributions to the American cancer society, $2,515 and counting because the pictures are still on sale. Um, just go to the eight by 10 section. There's both the lane Eaton and Cornette combination of the midnight express autographed and our reunion photo uh from 25 uh of our 25 year anniversary all of us have autographed it for the 35th and five dollars off each picture goes to the american cancer society and the crusade for children in may and this was just remember the epos or the uh, restraining orders as we like to call them have been on sale for a while but the t-shirts hate is a hell of motivator t-shirts just went on sale about May 6th or 7th or whatever. <clears throat> we did $590 to the crusade in the month of May, plus $100 from Lee Petrie, plus miscellaneous fans, some MLW fans up in Milwaukee gave me a few uh, 20s. So that's another $100 or so. But because of the previous success of the restraining orders and the ongoing success of the hate T-shirts, our 2017 through 2019 totals for the Crusade for Children, $5,090 and counting. So we're now with the cult's donations on our behalf and at our behest over the last two years for the Crusade and American Cancer, we are around or approaching $10,000. So that ain't bad. That's great. Oh, that's great. Well, yeah, yeah. I did $12,000. Wait a minute. For what? Where? For who? 
For is charity. That when you, is that when you started that fucking halfway house for girls that wouldn't go all the way? Is that when that? <laughs> you can, when did you raise twelve thousand dollars for charity? I just spent twelve thousand dollars. Does that count? Oh, only if you spend it with a charity, and 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 home improvement. Fuck, I've tried this. Home improvement <laughs> is not tax deductible in most of these instances. They want you. They want you to improve poor people's homes for charity, not not improve your own. All right, this is not, what I was told. It may not have been charity. <laughs> it meant char- charity begins at home. <laughs> uh, anyway, um, it, it, Brian, is it me? Am I cursed? Yes. But, okay. Well, yeah, and, and a quick answer to that question. You know, whenever I leave town, whenever I leave, whenever I go on the road, as they say, whenever I go travel to these uh, these uh, uh, dates that I do, these appearances that I make, uh, things that I have on a business level, I've always got some fucking issue. And normal, and people got well, Cornette, if you would fly, well, some of this is not related to flying, as we mentioned the the trip to Milwaukee with the thunderstorm and the travel, d- you know, problems. And as announcers of a live show, you know, you like to know who's on the live show before it goes on the air live. You like to know this. So it's, it's, it's these stressful trips, but it, I figured last week I'm in good shape because we, we went to the Florence freedom game, Florence, Kentucky. For those of you not well-versed in, in, in geography of the bluegrass state, Florence is up in Northern Kentucky. It is a suburb uh, in the metropolitan area of Cincinnati. And they have a fine uh, minor league ball club there named the Florence freedom. And they were having pro wrestling night <clears throat> at the same time they uh, they uh, uh, were having their game with the Windy City Thunderbolts, who are the biggest heels in the, in the city of Cincinnati and, and environs around there now, because they won by one run. So pro wrestling night, we got over, but the home team didn't. But anyway, I digress. And I'm thinking this is 80 miles up the road. They got a nice hotel for us. It's right next to the ballpark. It's this nice one of these nice new ballparks that have been popping up across the country. Uh, and and so this is going to be easy, right? And they're calling for good weather all evening. You know, it might be cloudy, but it's not going to rain or anything. And uh, and uh, the, it's just going to be a box of fluffy ducks, right? Well, it was in most part. And oh, and and, and Jim Ross is going to be there, and Stace r- rode up with me. Because it was close, we we gave baby a play date at the pet suites and get her you know brushed out and fixed up and give her a nice overnight townhouse and let her play with the puppies and we're gonna have you know an adult night out without the kids and then we're gonna go to the the, the what's what's better in the summertime baseball under the stars pro wrestling night Jim Ross never gets to Kentucky we're gonna take him out to dinner and guess where we're planning to go. There is a Quaker steak and lube in Florence, Kentucky. I've 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 talked about it on the, my fondness for the lube and the the greatest chicken wings in the country and their variety of sauces. I use their seasonings at home. They have all the great burgers. They got the O rings, the onion rings. They're huge. The boom boom shrimp. You can literally you, if if you were going to the electric chair, if you were going to sit down at the urging of the warden and old Sparky, then I think you, you should ask for your last meal to be the Quaker steak and lube. Right. And so I'm in training for this. I had a little cheeseburger about one o'clock, but otherwise I'm staying away from, I'm not going to snack on the ballpark food. I'm going to save myself for my true love, the Quaker steak. So I can be unsoiled at dinner. Right. So the first thing I hear is shit's going to go sideways is when the gentleman, Josh from the freedom says, well, Jim Ross's plane's been delayed. He was supposed to get in at like one 30 in the afternoon. The, this wing ding, we met at five 15 because the event started taking place at five 30. There was a Q and a, it was an autograph signing. There was a throwing out the first pitch. I got it over the plate. Way over. Is there any video now, evidence? Well, no, but it it went it it went past it went over the catcher actually over the catcher it went past the plate it didn't go over the plate it went across the line in other words I threw the ball farther than the plate was just nowhere near the plate or the catcher 
who it went over. Any, he couldn't jump that high. Anyway, <laughs> so uh, this stuff's supposed to start at 530. JR may, if, if everything holds true at this point now, walk into the ballpark by 6, 610. Oh, shit. Okay. And that's exactly what happened. He did get, he would sat in Chicago for hours and hours. He had left Oklahoma, like his home four o'clock in the morning or whatever, 12 hours just to get to fucking greater Cincinnati. And literally the airport, the Cincinnati airport is like a mile because it's in Kentucky too. All the good stuff in Cincinnati, if you notice, is in Kentucky, but it's like a mile down the road from the fucking thing. So, and, uh, and we're signing autographs. There's a bunch of folks out there. We met all the, 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 the fans that came out, had some fun. Billy Gunn was there. Brian Pillman Jr. was there. Um, but, but the, you know, we really went from one thing to another. And finally the Q and a is over about 10 30. It was after the game, the, 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 the game was over. We, and then we did the Q and a afterwards for the devoted fans. And finally, I, I, cause we've checked the lube is open till midnight. So they put us in, in, in the, the cars that they'd driven us across from the hotel in and they drop us back off at the hotel. And now J, poor JR, it's now almost 11 o'clock and he's been on, on the road or working for 16 hours. So he bows out of dinner, which uh, he may have had a, a premonition of what was to come. But he bows out because his flight back is it, it leaves at 6 a.m. So he's going to have to get up in like f- fucking five hours from that point. Okay, so we're going to go have the lube, right? I've trained for this, ready for this. We pull in the lube parking lot, Brian, at 11 o'clock and walk in that door. We know we got an hour to go before they close, except they close the kitchen at 11 o'clock. Oh, come on. Now, I've been to the Quaker Steak and Lube in Charleston, West Virginia, and I'm pretty sure they're open till 1 a.m. on weeknights and 2 o'clock on weekends, and that's Charleston, West Virginia, which is not noted for its metropolitan nightlife. But yet, the, in greater Cincinnati, they're closing the kitchen of the Lube at 11 o'clock, and I'm uh, my, my jaw hit the ground. Uh, and I, I, I say, is this a common thing that you do? Oh, no, whatever. The, all right. So it's only it's a mile up from the uh, the exit that our hotel and the ballpark is at. This is a mile north. The exit. I said, we'll just go back to our exit and just eat something there because it's also it's dark. I don't know what else is around. As soon as we get in the car and start it up to go back the one mile to our hotel. Here comes lightning. Here comes a clap of thunder. And here comes a torrential downpour. <laughs> now, as we turn right and we get back on the, the entrance ramp to the interstate, and the folks maybe that live around the Cincinnati area will be able to figure out what we did, but I don't want to hear about it. But we get back on the entrance ramp to the interstate in this torrential downpour that suddenly developed, and the windshield wipers going as fast as they can. And I'm on this ramp and on this ramp and it keeps going and going. I'm like, what the fuck? We're only, a m-. and then I realized this ramp somewhere or another doesn't go back to the interstate before the exit for our hotel. Cause it was so close. Cause I see our hotel on the other side of the highway passing it on the left. There was no way somehow to get on back out to our exit. So now we have to go and exit a mile South to get off and turn around and the torrential downpour and people with their flashers on and what the fuck suddenly this is taking a disturbing turn. We're going to be killed out here on the highway, trying to get dinner, get off the next exit. And there is a sign that says steak and shake and steak and shakes always open 24 hours. And it says it's a mere quarter of a mile to the left. We got to turn around. Anyway, we will stop in the steak and shake. We'll eat something and we'll wait till this, monsoon blows over so we turn left and we go and we go up a block or two and and we see nothing and i'm saying it's been longer than the sign said so i whip in the gas station and i jump out in the pouring rain and i run in and i ask the guy hey buddy where is the steak and shake around here and he says oh it's right next to the interstate right i said well that's the way i just came i didn't see any sign he said well it's not on they closed down about a month ago so they're out of business. That's why we didn't see them because they ain't got their shit turned on. 
Now we got to get out of this fucking gas station back across the fucking street onto the goddamn entrance ramp in once again, a torrential downpour. And this time finally we get off now at our exit. It's we have driven two, three, four, we've driven four and a half miles to get back to our hotel. That was a mile away <laughs> in this torrential downpour back and forth. And I pull up underneath the overhang so that Stacy can get out without getting wet. And I think at this point, we're just going to eat microwave fucking shit from the snack bar, right? Because this fucking weather, somebody's going to be killed. As soon as she gets in and I pull into a spot and I run through the fucking rain and get back in the hotel, it quits raining. Yes. And now it's yes, just you're jinxed. A bone. Yes, you're jinxed. <clears throat> well, now, wait a minute. So, well, now it's not raining. I can see how to get out. There's a McDonald's and a Wendy's that's merely just down through one stoplight from this goddamn hotel. I'll go down and get something to bring back. So at least we got somebody. So I go down to the Wendy's. I get in line. I wait about five minutes. I get up to the order thing. I place the order. I wait about another 10 minutes. I'm thinking at least it'll be fresh. <laughs> I finally get up to the window. And I pay them. And after I pay them, they said, if you'll just pull up in that spot, because now I see they've got two or three other people pulled up because they're all fucking flummoxed. And I pull up and I sit there for, and now it's going on midnight and I'm hungry. And I'm starting to think, you know, maybe I'll just go across the street to McDonald's and tell them to go fuck themselves on this fucking $18 because God damn it. Maybe I'll get something quicker. And then McDonald's pops its light out. <laughs> And they turn the light because they close. <laughs> <clears throat> so finally, then the the woman brings the bag of food for the car in front of me out and gives it to them and they drive off. And then she tries to get back in the Wendy's and she's locked herself out. <laughs> and they don't know she's out there. She's knocking on the door. And she's knocking on the door and they don't know she's out there. They hadn't missed her. She, I could be a rapist, right? And finally... They let her in so that she, I said, if they let you in, can you bring my food back out? And finally, that's what happened. So it was a goddamn just to go an, an, a, a mile away to get my dream dinner turned into a nightmare where we were nearly killed in a violent torrential downpour and starved for two hours before being able to get the most meager of sustenance from a fast food place. How close were you to pulling up a Terra? I can't lift that much, uh, but the <laughs> intent was that the the will was there, but the body would not have <clears throat> would not have worked. I'm off Wendy's. Well, I am I am too, and also because Wendy sucks these days. By the yeah. way, yeah, uh, the fucking cardboard fresh cut fries that they shouldn't have fucked with and they changed their pickles and the meat now is not only flavorless but also too pudgy they don't smash it down flat anymore i could go on and on and nobody and this goes for every fast food place nobody has any pride of 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 employment there and and wants to ex except every once in a while you'll find a little old lady that actually tries to do things right Otherwise, it's like we're annoying them. Yeah, but that's not new. That's that's fast food for years. It's gotten much worse. As if, if, when you get as old as I am, and you've eaten as much fast food as I've, you know, it is much worse, much worse today. The lackadaisical nature and the incompetence. Don't even get me started. Okay. Besides Wendy being a goddamn. One of the big wigs behind Wendy's being a huge Trump supporter, one of these investment firms or whatever that owns a big piece of it. McDonald's is doing better these days. McDonald's has got serious about that. The quarter, double quarter pounders are much better than they were a few years ago, but they still got to work on this bacon deal because four times I've ordered add bacon to that double quarter pounder and not once have I actually gotten the bacon. They don't pay attention. I guess you have to bring home the bacon yourself, but I've actually had Burger King a few times recently. I've been very pleasantly surprised by the quality of the hamburger. 
boy, I don't, I caught a few years ago, I was a regular Burger Kinger and I caught a, them a microwave and a lot of shit. And, and then they came out with that Angus burger that I tried that when I was still in TNA and my God, they put one too many letters in it. They should have taken, taken the G out of that Angus burger. And that would have been a more apt <laughs> description of what I tasted. And they tried to cover it up with barbecue sauce. It was like made from battery acid. So you couldn't, you could put that barbecue sauce they were using on cow shit and wouldn't have known what you were eating. They now have a chicken Parmesan sandwich, which is pretty good. Well, but Burger King has a chicken Parmesan sandwich. It like that, like the French toast Chateau serving fucking chicken fried steak. Well, I mean, maybe, I mean, in that case, but obviously the French Toast Chateau has to have other breakfast foods in order to get some of the, the ignorant people in there to try the French toast. You have to have does, pancakes and stuff. Does the French Toast Chateau have, have chicken fried steak? No. Well, there's where you've made one of your mistakes. I went to Cracker Barrel for breakfast the other day and had the chicken fried chicken for breakfast. For breakfast? Ch you, the chicken fried chicken with the sausage gravy Two eggs over easy on top of it with a side order of bacon on top of that and biscuits on the side. Your lips will smack your brains out and your, your teeth will thank you for putting them through that effort. See, I think this is an another one of those southern things. You know what else I've never had? Uh, chicken and waffles. Oh, God damn it. Which apparently is a big thing. I've never had. I've never even seen it offered on a menu. What? Where? Where do you get that? Well well, it's, it's, I mean, it's, it's now it's so common. Now they have a goddamn, uh, they have a fried chicken waffle kind of sandwich at White Castle where it's, it's like a fucking, it's a waffle bun and with the chicken in the middle. There's not a White it's Castle that, near me. And also I only do White Castle maybe once every 10 years. Well, and then I instantly regret it. And I'm just saying, <laughs> I'm not saying that's where you'll get the best chicken and waffles. I'm saying it's so widespread now that even they have done this. But a, a chicken and waffle, can't you imagine with that crunchy, spicy fried chicken and then you take a big old, big old piece of that buttermilk waffle and you roll it around in that maple syrup and you stick it in that piece of chicken and you put all that in your mouth and then you put all that in your mouth together. <laughs> you put it in your mouth together, Brian Lass. It can't be said, you got to mix all those flavors together in your mouth and law your tongue around it. If I was you, Brian Lass, I'd law my tongue all around it like I was making love to a, a French woman in a whorehouse somewhere. And then, and then when you take and you pour some more of that maple syrup all over that waffle and you get it all nice and gooey and sticky and then you spear some more of it with your fork and slip some more of it into that fried chicken and you eat that fried chicken with that waffle oh you, you're definitely not gonna dumb yourself out of position there brian last the samoans only eat chicken and waffles with meat the samoans <laughs> only eat chicken and waffles with meat <laughs> Risa bowden <laughs> yeah, boy, Pierce. <laughs> anyway, you know, I'll tell you something else now that, that people should do themselves, not with other people. And that's grooming their, their private areas, their innermost thoughts and, and sanctuaries. And we, we made a big hit apparently here about a month ago with, with not only the fans and the listeners and the cult of cornet members, but also the fine folks at manscaped when we got our first sponsorship with them and they were so happy with the feedback that they got and the fact that, that I was blown away by, I didn't know this product existed and all of a sudden, and then I was just going ape shit over it, as you remember, because it was a revelation because I have in the past, I have used those big clunky plug in the wall sound like goddamn, you know, electric hedge trimmer barber shears to shave the various Sasquatchy patches that occur in a variety of areas across and around my body, whether it be the chestal area or the backal area, that sometimes my back hair is capable of being braided at some points. But also, oh, oh. you know, when you, well, unless you take care of it, unless you go oh. in there and do the routine maintenance every so often, is what I'm trying to tell you. And this is what makes it so much easier. Manscaped makes it so much easier, not to mention. The nether regions, the, 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 the places where because of age and potentially infirmity or, you know, I've got the bad knees, I've got the bad shoulders, I've got the bad back, the bad hip. I can't get in a lot of those positions anymore. Well, these tools and items 
make it easy for you to keep the grass trimmed, the 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 bushes and the shrubbery uh, groomed properly, uh, antifungal equipment because you don't want uh, you know aphids to set uh, set themselves loose in your bush. And so you got the antifungals and the cleansers and the chemicals and the creams and things to keep everything oiled, lubricated, smelling nice, and fully functional. And I like that. So no more fucking of, of, of that, that, that barber shear thing where it sounded like it, I was running some type of adult toy in hotel rooms. And what would the people in the next room think? This, this trimmer that you get with the Manscaped package uh, is is it's not only does it plug in and recharge with just a light cord, but it's feather light itself. And actually, it's in my it's in my toiletry bag, or I'd let y'all hear it again because I turned on the nice, pleasant hum last time. But you, it, it'll take hair off of uh, even the most wrinkled of areas. So if you got a problem with your coin purse when you try to get that thing slickered and come on a gold tooth, but you keep nicking yourself, no more of that. Even the lawnmower 2.0 with a skin safe technology will not nick or snag or otherwise uh, give you your own do it yourself vasectomy when you're just trying to keep yourself fresh. Because let's face it, folks, well, I'm excluding the female portion of the broadcast here now. Maybe I'm not in some cases. You never know about these things. <laughs> When you say that, well, no, no, we may have some hairy females. Well, when you when you've got when you've got full growth, if you ever notice when you go out in the park, when you've got a lot of undergrowth, you you, you retains a lot of dampness. Dampness can lead to mildew, and the last thing that any of us want is a mildewed crotch when we're trying to go out with our favorite member of the opposite sex or even the same sex because Manscaped doesn't discriminate either and is a friend to the <laughs> LGBTQ community. So regardless of what sex, opposite, or same that you want to go out with, <laughs> unless you want to smell like a swamp cooler, uh, <laughs> especially in the summertime, because I'm telling you, because... It, the, no, if I if I go a month without trimming anything and then go out in the summertime, I mean I've literally I'm I'm mildewing out and potentially got some of those fucking funguses that look like those giant mushrooms growing in amongst my pits and and things by the time that I get back in the house. So anyway, you've got a variety of things. Precision engineered tools for manscaping with the right tool for the job. The number one company in men's below-the-belt grooming, if you have had a fear or a bad memory of uh, potentially slicing yourself in an area that you'd rather ret retain uh, in one piece, that will happen no more. This stuff, it's waterproof. You can use it in the shower. Don't use the same trimming apparatus on your face that you use on, you know, Mr. Johnson and, and his boys or even potentially... You know, if you pass the taint there, you know, there's a lot of hair right around the, the Russo area. And, you know, if, if you're, you're flying blind back there, so you don't want to take something sharp or not made for the job. But these things, it's almost impossible to nick yourself. So you can get in that way, you know, when you drop the Browns off the Super Bowl or fire off a chocolate rocket or drop the fudge monkey out of his cage. Oh, my God. It, it will slip right out without getting all hairy and disgusting. That's see, the hair on your butt comes. Uh, that that's where uh, bad grooming and skid marks in bed come from. I learned that the hard way. If you take that stuff off, you will not put skid marks on your brand new sheets. Anyway, you can get folks twenty percent off, free shipping, and a free travel bag by going to manscaped.com and entering code JCE manscaped.com entered the code jce 20 percent off free shipping one of these nice travel bags you can put all these items in lotions and potions and things and carry them around and uh do yourself and your loved ones a favor especially if you're like me and make george the animal steel look like a, a hard-boiled egg i i don't know what to add to this well what are your personal experiences with the manscaping <laughs> Not sure. <laughs> you always seemed. 
I, well, I mean, you always seem to be a well-groomed young man, and you, and you seem like that. You know, some people you think of <laughs> if, if you say that guy looks like if he took his shirt off, he'd look like somebody shaved a fucking gorilla on the sides just enough to get by. No, I'm very lucky. I don't have a lot of body hair uh, naturally, so I'm very lucky in that way. Well, I'm telling you, it's it's all over the place with me. I look at someone like Dutch Mantel, and I just don't understand how I would go through life. If I had that level of hair all over my body, of course, that's before Manscaped, promo code JCE, uh, existed where Dutch was on the road with all that. Now he could shave himself down and look like a completely different human being. Well, yes, and and he uh, we've talked, he used to have to shave his wrists so he could put tape around his wrists. And he and, and they, uh, he and Lawler both would shave their sides for headlocks because that would be a really unpleasant environment. Who would you say are the hairiest wrestlers? I mean, the first people you go to were obviously... Dutch, I guess you'd say Long or two, even George Steele. But beyond them, beyond the obvious picks, who are some unheralded hairy Un- wrestlers? Unheralded hairy wrestlers. Oh my God. Um I'm trying to think of somebody that just overall in as many places had as, as much of a thicket of uh, now while Bull Curry, he was he was quite a quite a hairy uh, fellow. That's true. And um especially the eyebrows. Yes. And uh and actually it ran in a family cuz Fred Curry had some hair to him also, but not to the extent of Wild Bull. But I don't know Dutch may be a cake taker. It, can you imagine I if 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 Manscaped had been around as you said when Dutch was a young man, it would things would have been so easier for him. He may, he may today he may be a stockbroker on Wall Street. If if Manscaped had been around when he was a young man, but instead the the hairiness of his body led him to a carnival like profession. Well, listeners, feel free to hit Manscaped up on Twitter and let them know what you think of their fine product. Yes, yes, the Twitter is at Manscaped, and and I've so far I see I, I said to you the other day I said you know I'm just going to start saying the first thing that comes to my mind because every time I do it seems to be a big hit and if if Manscaped if they have enough of a sense of humor and 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 are cool enough people, if they are fine with us just not shitting on because their product is great, but just having fun with their product, and then, then they're folks that they need they need to be recognized for that. The fine folks at Manscaped on Twitter or go to manscaped.com, promo code JCE, and let them know you heard about it here in the midst of trimming taints and and things. <laughs> like that. Oh, come on. Uh, real quick, live events, <laughs> Chicago on July 6th. I, me- I meant to, wait a minute, I meant to hit this button. That's exactly what go. I want to be doing right now, right out the room. <laughs> right out the window, whatever's closest. Out the window. That's that's how uh, that's how the, the, the tale goes that Bruiser got the Indianapolis territory. He held somebody out a window by their heels. Nevertheless, anyway. Um, live events coming up. If you want to see me in person and who in the world doesn't at this point, uh, here's your summer, July 6th. I'll be in Chicago at Cicero stadium for the big MLW television taping Kings of Coliseum. And I'll be doing a meet and greet before the event, July 12th through the 14th. I'm at the Knoxville, Tennessee fanboy expo for the first time. And I'm looking forward to that. It's going to be some of the other guys there as well, including on uh, Saturday the 13th only, Bobby Eaton, Dennis Condry, and Stan Lane. The Midnight Express will be there with me. And August 15th through 18th, the gathering in Charlotte, North Carolina, a resumption of the annual Charlotte uh, Fan Fest in the summertime. The Midnight Express and I will be there along with a host of others. And that is pretty much uh, that right now is the last Midnight Express 35th anniversary uh, reunion on the books with all four of us. I th- the boys may be doing uh, uh, something later on in the year. I it was. Um, I'm trying not to commit <laughs> to any more live events because I'm so fucking burnt. But <laughs> we'll see what happens. Right now, Charlotte is the last one scheduled. Knoxville and Charlotte. Uh, and otherwise than that, it will be till at least. September, possibly later, when you folks will see me out in public after those three dates are over with. What are you doing this week, my my boy? It's another packed week, another hairy week on the Arcadian Vanguard Podcast Network. I want to remind you, you can keep up to date with all the shows and all the videos on Twitter at Super Podcasts. 
or on Facebook, facebook.com slash Arcadian Vanguard. A few things I want to hit here real quick. Of course, John Arezzi's Pro Wrestling Spotlight then and now. Thank you to everyone who's been listening. We have really been overwhelmed by the amount of people that have been listening already and the amount of people that have become patrons of the show where you can hear the complete, unedited, original broadcast after John and I play clips and discuss the backstory behind everything. We've been having several episodes now with the Power Twins in the studio, and I have to admit, they are obnoxious to a level I've never heard on a wrestling show before. Have you ever had any run-ins with the Power Twins? No, actually, I remember. I don't even think I ever met them. I remember seeing their pictures, and there was one group of the magazines, it may have been uh, George's, Napolitano's, that, that featured yeah. pictures of the Power Twins, but I never actually worked around them or saw them. Well, hear them on, well, hear one of them, David Power. Larry disappeared for this episode, but hear David Power <laughs> in the studio. Well, wait a minute. Episode. One of them could have, could have just imitated the other one and you'd never had to tell anybody. You would never know. But they're yeah. in the studio this week with John and a special guest, Gary Capetta, on this show from 1989. Really interesting stuff here. And I think everyone should check it out at pwspod.com or available wherever it is that you find your favorite podcast. Stick to wrestling with John McAdam and Sean Goodwin celebrating their one year anniversary on the air. Thank you to everyone who's been tuning in over the last year. A very special extended episode with special guest Jeff Baldron of Breaking K Fabe with Baldron and Barry. Check that out today at McAdamPod.com or available wherever you find your favorite podcast. Also want to make mention of the latest Super Stud Cast, Super Stud Cast number 18. Ron Fuller speaks with Ronnie Garvin. That's right. You have someone from the Southeastern Company and someone from the All-Star Company on the line at the same time. We talk about Ronnie's entire career, including his maybe controversial thoughts about Dusty Rhodes. Hear all of that in part one over 90 minutes for patrons of the Studcast. For only $2.99, you get in the door, and that's at patreon.com slash studcast. And of course, the 605 Super Podcast, the mothership! Hee-haw! <laughs> Thank you to everyone who has checked out episode 99. It has been through the roof. Episode 100, big episode 100, in production right now. It's going to be a few weeks because we got a few things planned where they'll either work out and it'll be spectacular or they won't work out and the stories behind trying to make them work out will be <laughs> just as spectacular. But it's a great time to go through the archive. All 99 previous episodes and all the special editions and holiday specials are up right now at 605pod.com. There are also a bunch of episodes on YouTube. And of course, you can listen to the latest episodes wherever it is that you find your favorite podcast. And thank you. We're about to hit this big milestone, episode 100. In the News with Jim Cornette will be returning on episode 100. And much, much more of the top 10 pandemonium theater and several big surprises we're working on right now so check it out today get caught up to date with the 605 super podcast thank you to all the new listeners all the new members of the cult of cornet all the new listeners of the jim cornet shows that have been checking out the 605 we really do appreciate it the mothership so let me is, is you just said in the news is this is, have you cleared this with stephen p new have i got a contract to resume doing the news, to be the anchor man for the news on your program? I don't believe I'm at liberty to speak about any legal issues here on the air. Uh, you have to go through Stephen P. New if you want an answer to that question. Well, if you need to sue, call Stephen P. New. But if you need me to read the news, <laughs> you better feed me some booze. I don't know what the... <laughs> All right. <clears throat> uh, NXT. Boy, did I need some booze. No, um... No, now everybody's going to think I'm going to shit on NXT. I shouldn't start out that way because then they'll just think, well, he doesn't like anything. I actually, now if I'd watched the whole thing, I'm sure I'd have found something that disturbed me. But I watched three matches, as, as I mentioned to you before we went on the air. Roderick Strong and Matt Riddle, Shayna Baszler, and how do you pronounce that girl's name? <laughs> Shirai? Shirai? E, uh, <laughs> help me. What was her name? I, I can't help you. Io Shirai or whatever the case. Yeah. She's a, she's a young Japanese girl. And uh, of course, Adam Cole and Johnny Gargano. Let's go in order. Uh, because I, obviously I didn't have time to sit down and watch almost a three hour show. Uh, but we wanted to talk about, because everybody's been, you know, asking me, um, I've reviewed Raw, I've mentioned MLW, I've took AEW apart, so let's do some NXT. Roderick Strong and Matt Riddle, besides the stuff that I've watched 
on purpose for the revival is I think the first NXT I've watched. Is it not? Help me. You've watched, no, you watched, I think Gargano and Ciampa when that happened. A while that's back. right. That's right. Yeah. That's right. Because that's the, where they just, it was just endless. Wasn't it? <laughs> and I think maybe way back, I got to remember, you may have watched some of the women's matches that were getting a lot of acclaim at the time. Of course, they're now on the main roster, the women that you were yeah. watching there, Asuka and a few others. Yeah. But anyway, so, but uh, Strong and Riddle first. I loved how they turned the lights on the crowd down when it was time for the, for the action to start. I, uh, uh, why that they have been doing it the other way, because Vince likes it. I know why. But that's what always disturbed me in the 80s about the WWF TV even then was having the fucking crowd lit up so much. And every time that WCW or any other company that I was around would try to imitate that, I fucking hate it. We know the people are there. We saw them before the match started. We don't need to see them all the time. <clears throat> and they actually have good audio so you can hear the people. Um, Beth Phoenix did a nice job on color. And, and once again, here we had the the antithesis of that a couple weeks ago when they stuck Allie out there on commentary for the all or nothing girls match. And she added nothing. Remember when JR said, well, how do you prepare to fight a girl like Nyla Rose? And Allie's, Oh my God, I don't know. <laughs> that right. was a pithy analysis, but Beth, she was a competitive wrestler and an athlete. So she kind of has that, uh, approach that she can use also but she she did a very good job she added shit she sounded like an announcer rather than one of the girls trying to be an announcer just like that a lot of times when the guys who don't know how to announce sound like they're trying to they're being one of the guys trying to be an announcer instead of an announcer you know what i'm saying <clears throat> anyway this is the first time i've seen matt riddle i've heard his name so much and everybody's um you know, praised him and everything. And as soon as he came to the ring, I wanted to not like him because I thought the outfit looked a little goofy and, and his mannerisms, I didn't quite get it at first. It just, it looked strange. But when, when they, when they started working and they got the match going, he sells well, he does some good shit. He knew what he was doing. Roddy was calling the thing and running the show. You could tell, and it had a good pace up and down, but, but Riddle has a lot of fucking potential and, and the barefoot thing again, it just, I guess it works for him because that's his gimmick and that's his personality, right? Um, he doesn't, well, he comes from the UFC. So it well, yes. And also, with, yeah. yeah it, and he would be the, he would be the absolute with the, with the personality, he'd be the last person you think was a, a UFC MMA fighter, but he, but since he was, it kind of works for him. It's goofy, but it works. Right. Um, <clears throat> I thought there, the fans are cheering both there. There was no real heel or baby face. Roddy worked more heelish. But if, if you were in a vacuum, Riddle's kind of prancy, you know, goofy outfit gimmick would seem heelish. But obviously, these people knew who everybody was. They were watching the show, and they were educated. Um, I thought Roddy's facials were better than ever. And say, I've always been a fan of Roderick Strong's. In, in Ring of Honor 2009-ish, really, uh, the, the singles picture was Davey Richards, Eddie Edwards, Roderick Strong, and, you know, and, and, and a couple, and then we got Jay Lethal in there. But, but Roddy was, was one of the best workers in Ring of Honor of that era. And, and he's still in great shape. He's ripped. He's probably lighter and, and better defined than he was then. Um, his facials are better. And not only does he do all the shit that he used to do, but now he even, he sells it better. Uh, you know, it, it, the, 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 all these guys on this show were doing big shit to each other, probably too much. But at least here, rather than a, on a lot of independents you see, and even back in the old days in Ring of Honor with a lot of the guys, they would sell shit and not be afraid to sell it. <clears throat> and except later on, we'll get into with Cole and Gargano. Um, they wouldn't just fucking hit a big move and then the other guy that just got planted with it would pop back up and do something. 
So it was a good match. Uh, of course, I, I'm not a fan of the bro business just because bro puts me in mind of somebody. But if he can take it away from the ownership of Shitstain, it'll be great. Um, Riddle did that nice go to sleep German suplex combo where, yes, you would think the guy should take the bump off to go to sleep, but the way that he hit it and then grabbed him and took him, it was, it was really good athletically. Um, Roddy's flurry and the false finishes at the end had the fans rocking. They were into it. Roddy's knees and backbreakers are, are still good. People popped on the stronghold. So that means they've been educated to the, uh, uh, to the holes as well. The fans have riddle used his shoot wrestling background. Well, and riddle win one with, I have no idea what he fucking called it. I, they screamed it. I couldn't hear it, but it was a combination. He got the guy up like for a gotch pile driver, but then dove forward and flattened him like AJ styles is styles clash. But it was, it was convincing whatever it was. Do you have any idea? I don't. I haven't watched NXT in quite a while. So, see, you make me watch it. No, the listeners but you don't demand even... that you watch it. You made me watch But anyway. <laughs> well, maybe. Um, but, you know, here's the thing. This was, this was one of the styles of Ring of Honor that I sold Sinclair Broadcasting on. High-level athleticism. They were treating it serious, like a serious match. Um, they were... Uh, they're obviously... It, it, they hit hard and the shit looked good and there was nothing silly or stupid and it looked competitive, even though, yes, you can see through because of the complexity of some things. But guys that, that can do it at that level can, can let you lose yourself in it. And you forget sometimes that it's, it's a performance because they're doing it at a high level. I thought that that was great to build on in Ring of Honor as along with teams like the Briscoes. And and Hero and Claudio and and Haas and Benjamin that could mix regular pro wrestling with either an amateur background like Haas and Benjamin had or violence, believable violence and blood like with the Briscoes or a variety of styles of wrestling that they were good at like Claudio and Hero. And I tried to weed out, honestly and frankly the silly indie shit that ring of honor was still doing that had, they had done since they started when they were a, an indie company to sell DVDs, but it, they needed to be bigger. And we tried to weed out the, the guys that were just so ridiculously small. And look here, Roddy is not a huge guy, but he looks like an athlete. And he wear your ass out. And he just did 20 minutes here. And, and you know, I don't think a lot of guys could have hung with that cardio. I'm talking about the ridiculous, either the no physique whatsoever or the indie guys with funny outfits. Or, you know, I'm sorry, I've always mentioned this poor guy's name, but the Grizzly Redwoods. You know, 140 pounds, like a, a glorified this Marco Stunt character is now just these. We tried to weed that out that appealed to the silly indie outlaw audience and and concentrate on the athletes like this that could be taken seriously and did something at a really high level approximating professional competition. <clears throat> and that's, and is so, and now NXT is just doing what ring of honor. The plan was for ring of honor to do 10 years ago. And with the guys that ring of honor was going to do it with. And it works. Imagine that. Um, and then I was, I was going to watch Cole and Gargano, but I stopped in the, uh, in the show with Shayna Baszler. And the young lady, Shirai, the young lady, I can't pronounce her name. Because I know that I haven't seen Baszler as a pro wrestler yet. But obviously, I've followed the four horsewomen women thing. And known that she and Duke and what Marina Shafir, who I think is married to Roddy now, right? And obviously, Ronda Rousey were fans and liked the business and wanted to get in it. And so anyway, I thought I would watch. And have you seen Shayna Baszler at all? I'm not talking about this match, but just work at all. I have a little bit uh, a couple months back, yeah. I'm a fan. I got to say, you know, we did a poll on Twitter because 
I wanted you to watch the whole show, and it seemed like that may be a problem. Uh, not that you were against NXT, it was just the process of how you would watch it. You didn't have a DVD of it, it wasn't on your TV, so therefore it was going to be a problem. So, I just got the air conditioning in Monday, and also, and I ain't got three spare hours. Right, so as we, know. we put up a poll on Twitter, I think there were 4,000 people that responded, saying, what match should Jim watch? And I had four options to put, and three of the matches you watched were three of the options. Cole and Gargano won by a landslide. We heard from a lot of people, though, that thought you should watch the Shayna Baszler match. They said Jim will love Shayna Baszler. A lot of people <laughs> picked up on that right away. Well, okay, here's the thing. She comes out automatically. She's got a different look. She doesn't look like all the fucking 90s and 2000s divas. The girl, you know, the, the oh, what was her name? The, the baby deer on fucking ice, uh, long legs, Stacy Keebler. Um, you know, that type of thing. She comes out, she's got a great game face. She comes out like she's coming out for a fight because she's had that background. The The nickname is Submission Magician. I love that. She looks like a heel badass and she had some fucking heat. So automatically I liked her before she'd done anything. Um, she, I, I can say that she needs to, and she's, once again, she's green, not even green now, but inexperienced. She needs to work on matching her facials and her natural body movements sometimes. Sometimes she goes from one thing to another, like you would see someone doing it because that's the thing they're supposed to do rather than this is really happening in the moment. But that's an experienced thing. Uh, but she manipulates the joints. Uh, th that re reality check wrist elbow stomp thing. I haven't seen that since the fucking seventies, you know, where, where they bend the, the wrist down on the mat and then stomp the elbow and try to break the, uh, that was fucking yeah. cool to see that again. Um, so working the joint manipulations and the submission, she's physical. Uh, like I said, with experience, it'll, she'll get smoother and more natural when she works a hold. I think for who she looks like she should be, her facials and her body language should be more aggressive. She should really be kind of Chris Benoit doggish, get on that fucking hold and done and jerk and crank and and have the the meaner face because you know there was a couple things there. But um, the other girl was fine, uh, but I was watching for Baszler. But the Shirai turned it on at the end. And they sold everything that they did. So, you know, it wasn't, once again, this this wouldn't have worked 20 years ago because then people would have seen it and said, well, shit, if the girls can do that, then the guys should have to run each, over, run each other over with a fucking truck. Well, now it kind of works, and they didn't do anything just really screwy where you said this exposes the business. Like, remember when, when I said uh, the, one of the 120-pound girls did a vertical suplex to the other girl off the apron onto the floor. And then they continued the match. And I was like, fuck, even, even if you can, you shouldn't be able to. <clears throat> but anyway, they, they sold everything. And then I guess, the girl, I guess it's Candace LeRae. She used to be blonder when I've seen pictures. But she came out. Because here come Duke and Shafir. And they were coming to the ring. And LeRae comes up from behind him with a kendo stick. And just beat the fucking shit out of these girls. I'm mean, what the fuck was the matter with this girl? Is there heat? Does somebody owe somebody trans? Was uh, somebody <laughs> lost a bet? Oh, good Lord. Hold on one second. No, in all seriousness, this was like, I don't understand the kendo stick anyway. I mean, when, if you were, if it was a Japanese manager of a Japanese tag team, Tojo, where it worked with the kendo stick, right? But just when it became a thing in the 90s and everybody was beating each other, for one thing, you can't work with them or it looks stupid. You have to hit people. And yes, the noise is part of the the attraction. There is some give to the things, but it still marks you up and stings. It's like, what the f It's so funny. I just, it's overdone and stupid. But having said that, she wailed on these girls to the point where I'm thinking, this is, this, she was reckless as fuck. To the point where if that has been guys from 20 or 30 years ago, they would have been waiting to speak to Miss LeRae when she got back in the back. I don't know what the fuck. Why? And <clears throat> I was afraid at one point she was swinging so wild she's going to hit somebody in the front row. So that it looked real. But what the fuck? Um, and then uh, back to the match, uh, Baszler and Shirai, they did nice false finishes. 
it had when Baszler got the rear choke, it had great heat. Once again, they've educated the fans that these holes could be the end. And, and are often the end. And it was on a while. They kept switching and kind of, you know, modifying it a little bit. And they, the people stayed with it. It was a little long for my taste, but they reacted to the tap. And so that that was a great match and a great piece of business. It was a, a very good girls match and a good finish. And I like Shayna Baszler. And then guess what they did? They shit on the whole thing. They go to their what? replays, they go to their replays, and they do all the things. Shayna Baszler has just had her finish on this girl, then they've had this back and forth match. And then she's choked her out right then and there and won the match on a tap out. And suddenly after the replays, here old Shirai comes back with that kendo stick and once again just wailed on Shayna Baszler just like it was fucking personal. And I mean, seriously, and then hit her with a moonsault and then went outside and got a, a metal folding chair and went up to the top rope and did a moonsault on Shayna Baszler as a splash with the metal folding chair on her fucking stomach. So it went from Shayna Baszler got over with that. I thought that was a, a very good match where everybody looked good and Shayna Baszler got over to then suddenly the other girl goes from zero to hero after a choke out almost instantly and lays the fucking girl out that just beat her, including now a moonsault with a chair as a splash. Now I don't care. I'm being sexist for the girls. You've gone too far. Does that mean that the, the fucking guys need to be run over by a fucking freight train? It would just, and just, it just, why, why not do it on TV next week? Instead of just negating the, the girl's win just right there. I don't fucking know. If Shayna Baszler had slipped over, and also this is the baby face. Well, I guess now she's switching heel because they were going, well, we've never seen this attitude. But if Shayna Baszler had slipped over and cheated some kind of way, and the baby face comes back and beats up the heel, okay. Or if Shayna Baszler fucking does what she did and just chokes the girl flat out until she taps then she needs to get her hand up and there and there ain't there'll be a comeback later or if they're going to switch the girl heel do it in some other then right after she just tapped out it just why would she just come back and then just lay waste to this fucking girl i don't know we spent so much time with the review of AEW's double or nothing talking about the commentary what did you think of the commentary here for NXT well maro ronaldo's fam- fantastic um I, I can see where some people, but I used to do the same thing. Like he's too far up, but uh, you know, on my OVW show, I was too far up too, but I was excited for real. Uh, but Morrow does a great job. And Nigel, he has a ton of experience. Now he started with ring of honor in 2011. That's eight years ago. So I think he really does a good job. And he's the, he's the ex jock that has been in that position has been a wrestler, but also he's literate and, you know, and intelligent. So it's not like, Oh yeah, you know, wrestling been very, very good to me, you know? So I, I, I think they did an excellent job also. And they tell good stories. All right. Um, Adam Cole and Johnny Gargano in the interest of full disclosure, I've said it before. I've been an Adam Cole fan since I saw, I saw him. He was 19 years old in ring of honor, him and Kyle O'Reilly. Um, I think Adam Cole, just watch the entrances besides the rapper. The rapper came out and wrapped Adam Cole to the ring. And, and you know, me and rap. So that was a chore to get through, but actually the guy did for rap. The guy did a good job of, rap if that's a possible thing and it's adam's song right it's adam cole's gimmick there's some good rap well anyway but when you watch adam cole's entrance he's got facial expressions he has confidence he's got a swagger he's got body language he has adam cole baby he's got the the, he's got the fucking aura about him that he is somebody and he's got, yes, he, he's got long hair. And, and I, I guess they try to cut now the NXT's guys' hair a lot of times because they don't want everybody with long hair. But, well, that, rock stars have long hair. Movie stars a lot of times have long people People that you pay to see sometimes have long hair. Then here comes Johnny Gargano. 
And I'm going to get it out of the way early because athletically he's fucking great. And he can do some incredible shit. But here comes Johnny Wrestling, whose entrance music sounds like it's an 80s tune by the Go-Go's. And he looks like a guy. He's got a regular haircut. He's got <laughs> smaller than regular size. Yes, he's almost the same size as Adam Cole, but he's lean. He's he, 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 he The only thing that stands out is his athleticism, but nothing about his personality stands out to me. He doesn't grab me. Who are you? Are you somebody? It's not just about his size. It's about the haircut, the facial expressions, of which he has two. Confusion and partial pain. <laughs> there is no, there's no cockiness. There's no fucking anger. There's no passion. There's no over the laughter. There's no, there's nothing uh, at any pole. It's all just right there in the middle. Just nah. I, it, it, since he's not six, five and 300 pounds and he, I don't, I heard the promos he did in the packages. I don't believe his promos either. I believe Adam Cole when he speaks to me, I, I believe Johnny Gargano kind of, I just believe that Johnny Gargano is a boring guy to listen, talk to. If, 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 if something happened to him, like when Paul Ellering switched from baby face to heel and suddenly became precious Paul and found it or Rick rude or, any of the people that went from just blah to look at this fucking guy, then his in-ring and his physical and everything is great. But he doesn't have anything that stands out except for the in-ring. And everybody, apparently from this show, these days can do all that stuff. So, <clears throat> um, I mean, you know, he does so many when he goes through the thing where he does the ducks and the reversals and the counters and the blocks, he does them seamlessly with no mistake and no change in facials and no change in body language or speed of movement. Like it's a surprise that he's ducked this thing. He knew he was going to do it ahead of time. It's not a shock that this thing was swung at him. He ducked it seamlessly to go to the next move. Um, he gets, he gets a clover leaf on Adam Cole with no change in his facial expressions and Adam Cole selling his fucking ass off in the clover leaf. The Cole stuff is sharp. It had snap. He still sold, but he had facials and body language. Gargano just goes through and the fans were into it because they all know it's a performance, but you know, truthfully to work like the badass that he works like instead of uh, being a tiny baby face fighting from underneath and selling to get sympathy, you know, he would have to gain 25 pounds, but sell to get sympathy. You would have to have a facial expression that would like a Ricky Morton where people want to come in and help you because they feel sorry for you. When Adam Cole put Johnny Gargano's uh, uh, submission hold on, it looked better than when Gargano does it. That's the only way I can explain it. It's just, there's no passion and emotion. And that's, and I'll say this real quick. They started hitting big shit back and forth and probably too much. But once again, people are looking for a performance. There's no, there's dueling chance. There's no hundred percent support for one baby face against hundred percent, you know, rejection of, of a heel. There's dueling chance to people are just watching. It's, it's like tennis when they, they applaud on exchanges. Um, they did a nice spot taking the referee out, but then it all came to a complete standstill and the referee got back up and they all started over again right before the finish. <laughs> what the fuck? Anyway, then they, they got them back. They got the people back and they did a great fucking finishing sequence. Adam Cole's two finishes. He jumps off the ropes and does a Canadian destroyer that he calls Panama sunrise. And then into his goddamn, you know, fucking, uh, uh, submission thing. So, uh, or his other thing, I don't know, whatever the fuck point is it, it, it Adam Cole shit looked great. He has oomph about him. He, uh, he's once again, he's not the, the Hulk Hogan or the Steve Austin or the giant, whoever the top guy is of a generation, but he is a main event money ball player in professional wrestling. Johnny Gargano, 
can do all the things physically, but until he gets some type of personality, facial expression, and or gains about 25 or 30 pounds or does something to make him more intimidating physically or or charismatic, mag a magnetic personality for people to watch or whatever, I think he's going to appeal to the fans who performance wrestling of this type appeals to. You're not buying it as a fight, but boy, it's a great performance. And those are my notes, but that's, <laughs> that's the thing is I just, what I miss about wrestling is grudge matches and jump starts because the baby face hits the ring and he can't wait to get even for what has just been done to him. And the people fucking blow as soon as they see him jump on that fucking heel. Cause they want the fucking heels blood. They want to see him die in front of them. I miss blood and violence. I miss a semblance of real anger and hatred from the guys that are fighting. I don't believe a lot of these guys really hate each other or that they really are mad at each other and angry. I not only miss that, but I miss the, the, the anger and the hatred from the fans or the universal love of the baby faces and the hatred of the heels because of the, the atmosphere that that created in the buildings and how not only did it lead to tickets being sold at a much more rapid pace, but it also led to a tremendous atmosphere to work in where you could do literally half as much to your body and get 10 times the response. But I mean, <clears throat> none of these guys are trying to simulate a fight where two guys just want to go out there and rip each other's eyes out and choke each other to fucking death for fun. I'm not getting any real semblance of, like I said, anger, hatred, jealousy, violence, and blood. We got some violence and blood with Dustin and Cody. That was the best piece of pro wrestling business I've seen in ages. But you don't get that almost anywhere. We got some, and that's why I like that MLW match with the Von Erichs and Tom Lawler against the Contra unit that I plugged for watching uh, on BN Sports on June 22nd. Because it was a fight. There was some blood and some anger and some chaos. And fans were starting to throw some shit because they were kind of getting a little fucking upset. Instead of this, let's sit back and applaud like a tennis match because these guys are performing excellent, you know, physical maneuvers to each other. The match got 5.25 stars in the Wrestling Observer Newsletter. Any? Oh, God. But... <laughs> No, it it wasn't Flair and Steamboat. It wasn't Lawler and Funk, and it wasn't. No, it wasn't. And it, it, once again, yeah, maybe for for execution of acrobatic gymnastic moves, yes, it was about as good as you could possibly expect two humans to do. But I think Adam Cole is is capable of more, um, because as we've talked about, there are three reactions in wrestling. Yay, cheers, boo, heat, and wow, shock, or ooh, look at that. Yay and boo are what draw you money. Wow is what you put in the middle. Wow doesn't draw the money on its own. So I, 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 I really believed that Roderick Strong and Matt Riddle were having an athletic contest where they were trying to beat each other more than Adam Cole and... and Johnny Gargano because they they try to make things so complicated that there's no way that these sh these things can be happening just on the spur of the moment. With Roddy and Riddle when they were rolling through in some holes and reversals and grabbing a leg and turning because that that can happen and they're well versed in mat wrestling. But when Adam Cole and Gargano turned up the high spots, it just it gets so. Even though they're doing it well. Am I explaining this right? It just it's too perfect and too seamless and too much to you you can't keep believing that they're they hate each other and they're really hitting each other. Did you have any I, did you have any issues with the match length of the main event? It was fucking long. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, once again there was the spot where they took the referee out, and that would have been a great place to go to a finish. And instead they waited till he got back up and they slowed everything down and then they started going again. I did it, it just 
every match does not have to be 40 minutes long to be a classic. And and they should. That's it, it, one thing they should do. I mean, NXT, no doubt, has trained these people to follow wrestling and the the moves and the submissions, and they're trained to the, the things the guys do and their catchphrase, and Adam Cole, baby, you know, tore the fucking house down. But they also should condition people that every fucking main event match doesn't have to. It can be wild and crazy in 11 minutes instead of, of dramatic classic in 33. The, 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 the Midnight Express Fantastics match at the first Clash of Champions, the whole thing with entrances barely scratched 10 minutes. And people were blown away because it's what we put, the time we put in it. That's why we did it, because we found out we only had like seven minutes bell to bell to go on the live show. We're like, okay, well, they'll remember this. If I can ask you a couple things here, you saw the three top matches for this NXT TakeOver show. How would you compare the three top matches here to Double or Nothing? Not just in terms of the actual matches, but in terms of the atmosphere, in terms of the fan reactions. How would you compare and contrast those two shows? NXT was a much more professional production all the way around. Um, Yes, you had Jim Ross on a Double or Nothing, and then you had two novices. The announcing here, and especially, like I said, Beth Phoenix did a great job. And I'm not just a, a fan of a, a, a female color commentator for the sake of having a female do it. She did a good job. Uh, so the announcing was better. The television production aspect was better, including the lighting and et cetera, although that's not, you know, I mean, the, the WWF's been, E has been doing this for so long, and they have so many resources at their disposal. That's not a surprise nor unexpected. Um, as far as the match quality, you had one thing on double or nothing that was blow away, which was dusty and dusty. Well, I wish it was Dustin and Cody. But if you're going for just high impact athletic wrestling with a lot of stuff being done, both Roddy and Riddle and, uh, uh, Cole and Gargano was at a higher level than the Bucks and the Lucha Brothers because both these matches, both the NXT matches technically made sense. Whether they did a few things too much at one time or another is immaterial. They made sense in the, in the matches instead of being just an obnoxious series of people just doing shit to each other for no apparent purpose other than do it. Um, and as far as the uh, uh, girls match or ladies match or however it needs to be termed these days, uh, the NXT girls match was much better than the double or nothing girls match, because as we mentioned, it was a four way, nobody gets over in a four way. They wasted Kong, et cetera. No, I mean, you know, I still, I thought that Here's what I thought. The the SoCal Uncensored match on Double or Nothing looked more like it belonged on the NXT show in terms of professionals trained at a high level doing high-quality athleticism and being serious about it. It looked like it belonged with these matches that I saw rather than on the show that it was on, and nothing on that show that I saw besides Dustin and Cody could match the overall professionalism of the NXT show if that makes any sense. If we go under the premise that Triple H will take over from Vince whenever that day comes that Vince isn't in charge anymore, what do you think? I mean, considering this is his baby, NXT is his, he's in charge of it. What do you think of that product? What do you think of the idea of that being what the WWE would have as Monday Night Raw, for instance? Well, it's a whole lot better than what they got right now. Um, And once again, at least it seems like these guys are taking this shit seriously. I didn't see any goofy fucking gimmicks in NXT. I see goofier gimmicks whenever I watch Raw than I do on NXT. Um, I think Triple H has probably made peace with the fact that we're never going to have real anger and hatred and heat in a building again because everybody knows. So let's go with the, which is the tact that I was taking 10 years ago. Go with high-level athleticism. And competition and draw some from MMA. This is this was the Ring of Honor game plan fucking ten years ago. Uh, it don't do the silly shit that the indie outlaw guys like to do, which is why apparently they're all over there at fucking Double or Nothing. 
this is this is Ring of Honor with a huge fucking budget. So I can't really not like it. I just think, you know, there's there's small critiques. I think Johnny Gargano needs a personality. I think not all main events have to be 30 minutes and have everything because goddamn in five years, what what are you setting yourself up to to do to top this? Um and and you know, and I just wish once that we'd get somebody that breaks the mold of the, the people that break in the molds these days are the girls. All the guys are almost the same size, look the fucking same, and work the fucking same. Whereas the girls now look more badass than than some of the guys do. I'd 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 love to. I, yes, I'd love to see Ricky Steamboat and have that bodybuilder physique. But the way that he sold and conveyed pain was like a ballet dancer. But I also want a fucking Terry Funk. It's goddamn crazy fucking lunatic shouting suey pig at the top of his fucking voice while he bites the fucking gash in his opponent's head and spits blood in the air. Because that's wrestling too. We we need some fucking... So we, need, we need a more violent aura and we need some fucking emotion from the guys. And the, the John Moxley... When he came in looking like he wanted to take a chainsaw to the whole fucking world, he'd been released on that double or nothing thing. Johnny Gargano walked down to the ring like he was checking to see if his kid just got off the school bus. <laughs> it <can't>. So, <laughs> so it's I mean that's I mean is, is this is too much for a boy to ask. No, there, there. I can't motherfuck any of the people that I saw in the NXT event, and I'm a fan of a number of them. But I, you know. As far as I'm concerned, a great pro wrestling match that draws money is still closer to Stone Cold Steve Austin and the fucking Rock than it is to Adam Cole, even though I'm a fan of his, and Johnny Gargano. We need to get some fucking, we need to get some uh, emotion in this. Somebody needs to fucking fuck somebody else's wife or cut somebody else's fucking dog's throat. Personal issues. Personal issues draw money. And and a lot of the packages that I see from NXT or WWE or whatever, I'll say, from a lot of companies, I'll say this and then we'll wrap up. These days, it concentrates on, I'm the champion. I've achieved my dream. No. I want somebody to rub it in my face. I'm the fucking best. I always knew I was the best. Now I proved it. And all these fucking pricks that you like are going to have a big problem taking it away from me because I can kick the shit out of them. So fuck you. This isn't my dream. You're lucky to have me. Just a thought. Do you have any thoughts? Uh, no. I, Would I, you share I, I, them with I me? I was just thinking you're lucky to have me, actually. I have thoughts. I'll share them with <laughs> you. No, I, I, I can say that. Whenever I have watched NXT and I haven't watched it in a little while, and I actually may go and check out this card because I know a lot of uh, the listeners were raving also about Velveteen Dream versus Tyler Breeze. So I do want to see that. And it was a tag team match that some people told me they liked. I do want to see the rest of the card. But whenever I watch NXT, I find myself, it's not exactly what I want, but nothing is going to be. Nothing's going to be great improvised interviews. It's just not going to happen. Nothing's going to have emotion like that, especially when the fans are just in the chanting. I mean, you're just not going to get that. That's why Dustin and Cody did stand out. One of the things was the fan reaction to it all. Uh, the fans were emotional. So, yes. you know, it, it got you into the match more. But I find myself really enjoying NXT whenever I watch it. And I, I think out of all the wrestling that's out there today, it's the one wrestling company within a company, I guess I should say. But it's the yeah. one wrestling promotion group whatever you want to call it that does the most amount of things the way i would like it out of everyone out there yeah it, i just i wish any in any wrestling promotion I, I i just wish that i would like to be watching the show sometime and suddenly a 35 year old don fargo or a 22 year old terry gordy in a bad mood or <laughs> Or, or fucking, or a fifty-year-old Nick Bockwinkle, or somebody shows up and just takes me to another fucking place, and all of a sudden, everybody's serious, and this, and this shit's life or death because that's you know, and and there's people trying to climb the fucking rail because I mean you know the Fargo and Gordy could have done it in a fucking ice flow, uh, but just somebody different than that breaks the mold, and and see that's what in their little P brains and their little minuscule midget minds, the hardcore wrestlers 
think they're doing that. Think they're taking people, you know, and oh, now this is suddenly real and disturbing and everything. No, it's fucking stupid and it's disturbing, but it's good. It's not real. It's just stupid and goofy and disturbing. But I'm not talking about going out and actually fucking stapling somebody's, you know, dick to the fucking wall or slicing somebody's arm with a razor blade or whatever the fuck and all this hardcore bullshit. I'm talking about people who have that magnetism that can go out in front of a bunch of people that may even be smart to the wrestling business, but they just instantly fire people up, these guys, and they just instantly get a reaction, and they instantly can convey that regardless of what you may know or don't know, this person I'm looking at, Joe LaDuke, is a fucking lunatic, and there's an aura of menace about these people, and they will fuck you up if you fucking question them or get in their way. That's what we're missing about professional wrestling, and and I don't know how to get it back because you can put guys out there that legitimately are people like that that legitimately could fuck you up, and half the fucking people today would ju- because it's all not to be taken seriously anymore would think it's all a complete joke. I bet they'd laugh if Brock Lesnar actually fucking tackled some motherfucker, heckling him, and took him down and elbowed him into fucking Neptune. I bet some, a lot of people would think it was a fucking work. And you, I remember the first time I saw Roddy Piper live, he beat the fuck out of somebody in Cincinnati. On the way to the ring, Cincinnati guards, it was 1981, but they, they were, Cincinnati was a hot town in that day. And Crockett's TV, it was hot all of a sudden. They had 8,000 people there. Piper's a hot heel. He's on the way to the fucking ring. This guy runs up and either takes a swing at him or hits him or does whatever. And Piper decked that guy and got on top of him and just waylaid him. And by the time the cops dragged him out from under Piper and they carried him back, he was having convulsions. That set the tone for that. And then here comes the baby face starts kicking a shit out of Piper. And it looked like the fucking Roman Coliseum. Beers going in the air, people fucking standing and screaming. You can't get that level of legitimacy anymore. And that's what's, I think that ultimately is what's missing. Why this, it just doesn't click any other way because the guys are going out there to put on a performance and the fans are full, well knowledgeable that they're about to witness a performance. So instead of yay and boo, all you get's wow. Wow. As we mentioned, don't draw you that much money. Anyway, what do you have to say about this issue, Mr. Last? I tend to agree with you on most of these things. It's why I don't watch that much wrestling nowadays. I'm a big wrestling fan who doesn't watch that much wrestling because (laughs) what I enjoy isn't there. I've said it before, when in the era of tape trading, I like getting the five-star matches out of All Japan. I like getting the New Japan Junior Heavyweights. But I really liked angles and interviews. And you don't get interviews with guys that are just talking that are just being themselves or amping it up and making you believe in them. And you don't get hot angles for me, at least. I mean, some, someone yeah. else may say, Oh, they're hot. But to me, it's not because I've seen hot angles. Well, yeah, yeah. It, it, we, I unfortunately saw New Jack are... live in Knoxville. <laughs> I got, you know what I mean? Like I saw the last era of guys who could do amazing promos off the cuff live in front of a giant room full of people and get them fired up. I've seen it live. And it's just, you don't get that anymore. And that was, that was a big part of why I liked wrestling. And it's just not there. <sighs> well, you know what else ain't here, don't you? I don't. Any more of this program, because we're going to close it up here. <laughs> <laughs> we're going we're gonna to close it up here. And we're going to come back next week with even more goodness. Uh, but now I can't wait to hear all the people say that, well, so fuck. Cornette uh, uh, said that Gargano should be boiled in oil and have his fat sold for soap. And uh, and whoever Adam Cole has sex with, obviously I'm against him. That's I'm sure that's what everybody will get out of this program. But anyway, that's <laughs> you my think it'll thoughts. Be that? Do you think it'll be that? Or do you think well, it'll who be... knows what? Nobody else listens to anything else I say anyway. How dare he like that more than... All elite. I think that yes. may be part of it. Did you hear the horrible things that he said about Matt uh, Matt Riddle and Roderick Strong? He said that it was the best thing that he saw out of the other three matches or whatever the fuck. That's horrible. Did you hear what he said about that match? He hates feet. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, the a well-turned ankle. Well, nevertheless, anyway, 
Uh, folks, if you liked this, next week we'll do more. If you didn't like it, next week we'll try to be better. And if you really just didn't like anything, then thank you. Fuck you. Bye-bye, everybody.